Hello everyone and welcome to our evening lecture, Global Health and Climate Crises with Dr. Michal Nachmany. This is the third of our autumn series of virtually speaking online lectures, which began in July. Tonight, Michal will be speaking on two of the most pressing issues facing the world today, the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis, how they are linked and how we can meet those challenges. Here at Latimer, it's been fantastic to see all our students back on site. And across the school, 230 of our students have started this academic year thanks to a bursary. Since we launched our Inspiring Minds campaign in 2014, we have raised almost three million pounds for the bursary's appeal. Small donations given at events like these have made a big contribution, so your donations really matter. £400 has been raised for the Bursary's Appeal in donations made at registrations for this event. A couple of house rules before we start. Everyone will be on mute so you can all hear the presentation clearly. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat facility so Michal can review them and answer as many as time allows at the end of her talk. So, we are delighted to welcome Dr Michal Nachmani, Policy Fellow at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics, where she leads the work on databases and tools, as well as heading the Institute's Climate Change Laws of the World project, documenting climate laws and policies, as well as project managing the Transition Pathway Initiative to support the transition to a low carbon economy. Michal is also a Latimer parent, as she mentioned. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Michal to this evening's lecture, Global Health and Climate Crises. It's funny, we are, we're on Zoom and we wave when we leave meetings now and we would never do that if we were in a room with someone. So our body language has changed um, and many other things have changed as well, of course, as you know. Um, and that's um, been an immense change for all of us. And what we're going to try to do today is we're going to talk about how the climate crisis and the COVID crisis are similar in their nature, um, in their sources, in their impacts, in their outlooks, and in the ways out of them. And we're going to show how um, COVID is potentially a cautionary tale for climate and how we can um, uh, take this collective uh, wisdom that we're accumulating now, because all of us are experts on COVID, you know, six months into this horrible adventure um, and how we can take this forward. So um, just a kind of a um, one sentence about uh, what I try to do and Natasha um, uh, threw some names and project names at you. Um, and I want to simplify that and say that over the past um, many years, but almost almost nine years now at the London School of Economics, I've been trying to support um, informed decision making both by uh, policymakers worldwide and increasingly by financial actors and investors worldwide. Now, we know that being informed is not enough, but we definitely know, and being informed doesn't mean that good decisions will be made, but we definitely know that without being informed, good decisions cannot be made. So we need information, we need insights on top of that, we need engagement, and we need buy-in. And our conversation here today is uh, my attempt uh, to get more buy-in. Now, obviously you've all signed up to the stock, so you care about um, this issue, or you're curious, or I guilted you into it. You know who you are. Um, but um, in order for us to really understand and to have agency in uh, supporting the solution of um, all the crises that we're gonna face uh, in our lifetime, and prepare our children for the crises that they will suffer in their lifetime, we will need a buy-in. Now, one of my favorite climate scientists um, is called Catherine Hayhoe. And um, Catherine Hayhoe has a great TED talk, which I highly recommend watching. And her TED talk says, her, the, the, the title of her TED talk is, the most important thing you can do about climate change is talk about it. And um, she is set in the heart of, uh, of, of the South in the United States. And she's an evangelical Christian, um, which sounds like a contradiction in terms and sounds like uh, impossible to, um, 
to navigate being an evangelical Christian and being a climate scientist these days. And what she does constantly is bring people in, put a um, warm arm around their shoulders from fossil fuel executives to um, homemakers and say, we are all in the same boat together. And we all maybe um, have different perception of the challenges, but essentially they're the same challenges. And we all want the same things. We all want to be loved. We all want a warm, uh, a warm home in the uh, winter and a cool house in the summer. We all want our kids to be happy. We all want to be healthy. We all want our parents to, to age well uh, without, um, without um, health crises and definitely not um, for us to not be able to say goodbye to them uh, when they leave this world. Uh, as the COVID crisis is, uh, has brought upon um, some of us. And how can we take this and make this into something that we all want to solve together? And once we agree on the problem, and it's not about science, um, then we can all think about the solutions. I'm going to tell my son to leave the room. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, one of the things that won the internet yesterday um, I'm going to share my screen with you and I will show you what won the internet yesterday because I think that's a really important thing to, um, to start a talk with and we've all been working uh, remotely. So um, where is my share screen? Here is my share screen. Can you see my screen? You may see my screen. Can you see Gretchen Goldman, PhD? No? Probably not, right? I'll let it be. Um, Gretchen yesterday had a, um, uh, an interview on CNN and she uh, posted a picture of her sitting nicely in front of the camera and looking at it, looking really tidy and professional. And then she took a side shot of that and she's sitting in her boxer shorts and the room is a mess full of her kids' toys. Um, and the title of that was, just so we're being honest. So um, there's a lot of honesty going on, including children walking into rooms and things like that. So apologies, but you all know the drill. Uh, you've all been working from home recently. So I think we're good. Um, now, I want to walk you through a journey uh, in the next uh, half an hour or so. And after that, we'll be super happy to answer questions. So feel free as you, um, um, as you, as we go through the talk, to type them into the chat box. I won't look at them immediately, but I'll, uh, we'll look at them later. And uh, Natasha and Lynn will facilitate asking those questions a little later. Uh, also, feel free to put in some thoughts, not just questions. Um, I know that I'm positioned as the expert now, and you're kind of listening. But you're all experts on life and on problems, and um, it would be great to uh, for you to put in your thoughts uh, on this. Uh, and to open a conversation, because conversations are super important about this. So in the next half hour, I want to lead you through a journey uh, that has four chapters, really. Um, and let's name them. Um, let's call the first chapter Fury. Um, and hopefully, and I mean, I don't know if this is a good tactic, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to try to do so you can measure me on my, uh, on my success later. I'm going to try to get you really, really angry about what's going on with climate change. Uh, I'm sure you're angry plenty about COVID already, so I feel I don't need to do a lot of work there, but I'm gonna try to get you really angry about uh, climate change. Chapter two is gonna be called grief. And I'm gonna try to get you really sad about uh, climate change and what we've lost and what we're about to lose. Um, but if I stop there, I won't be doing my job because it's not enough to be sad and angry about what's going on. And unfortunately, we see um, many media outlets, many authors, many voices out there that stop right there. And all they do is talk about sadness and grief. And I think that we are wronging our uh, purpose as humans if that's where we stop. Because chapter three is gonna be called agency. And we're gonna ask, okay, so what can we do? We as a collective, we as individuals, we as parents, we as citizens, we as voters, we as pension owners, we as anything that you like, we as um, uh, wonderful creatures roaming this earth alongside other many beautiful creatures. And the fourth is going to be called hope. 
because what I hope to demonstrate is that with our collective agency, there is hope. And that if we all pull together, as we have done for many great crises in the past, then we can sort this out. And I think that if we stop short of hope, then there's no point, right? If we stop short of hope, then all of us um, either can give up now or go on this crazy end of the world party and not care and go into this nihilistic state of mind, which is really unuseful. Um, those who have money will uh, buy a small island, uh, probably uh, somewhere up north uh, where it's cold enough and where climate change won't be horrible. They might have to hire a small private army to protect them because the world will be in chaos. Um, all of us mortals will have to probably live with the consequences of what we're up to. And if we don't offer ourselves a sense of hope, um, then what's the point? Now I talk about hope, and I'll talk about it a little more later, I talk about hope as a verb, um, not as a noun. Hope is something that we actively do. Hope is something that we actively have to work at while it's really not easy. I'm going to lead with the climate story and kind of weave COVID into that because in many ways they're mic macro and micro versions of, of each other. And, um, and the COVID story, as I think I mentioned, was, is a cautionary tale actually um, of what happens when you have a systemic, holistic, known um, uh, or, or could have been known um, crisis that, um, that is not dealt with properly. Now, both of those are devastating, usually to the same people. Um, because while um, COVID hits everyone, obviously the virus uh, is blind uh, in terms of the bodies that it attacks, we all know that it hits um, people of color more, it hits, it hits poor people more, and it hits um, anyone who's in a vulnerable state anyway. The people who can't, go to, can't, can't stay at home because they're working outdoors, because they are essential workers, because they work in the fields, because they can't uh, afford a car, so they have to take public transportation. All of these people are being hit the hardest by COVID. And climate change is, of course, the same thing. From our very local, um, um, very local communities to all the way to the global scale. Locally, it's the people who can't afford to pay for um, a nice electric car, but who are stuck with public transportation, with unventilated houses, with uninsulated houses, with no flood insurance for the floods that are hitting them. Um, and of course, the people who uh, need to work outdoors when uh, it's 38 degrees outside. That is true both in the UK and uh, everywhere around the world where the poorest and the ones who have actually contributed the least to the, to the problem um, uh, in terms of uh, global emissions are the ones that are being hit the hardest. Now, when we start thinking about the, the enormity of the change, then we think about, um, you know, if we think about COVID, for example, potentially we might think, okay, this is a story for the Ministry of Health. But we've all seen that if, we, that if we need to address this holistically, then the Ministry of Health is fine. You know, we, of course, uh, they play a major role, but it's the Department of Energy and the Department of Education and uh, welfare services and transportation services and our food distribution systems that all tie in and build this uh, complex, um, uh, this complex uh, picture that, we, um, that has multiple angles. Even if um, a vaccination would have been found today uh, and, uh, and fully distributed, we'd still have to think about our uh, education systems. We'd have to still have to think about our food distribution systems. And we'd of course have to think about the next virus that might pop up when COVID-19 is gone. Maybe it'll be COVID-20 or 21. Climate is of course a similar problem in terms of the enormity of the change. Um, and I'll do kind of a brief introduction to where we're at with climate in a minute, but climate means changing all of the systems uh, sorry, climate seeps into all of the systems that we're operating in, and therefore climate change um, demands that we change or address all of those systems, from the way we uh, produce and consume energy, to the way that we produce and consume goods, to the way that we grow food, to the way that we move around, both uh, locally and internationally, 
to the way we protect our communities, to the way that we look after those who are about to lose um, their livelihoods or who have lost them already, and to those who have lost the place that they can live in. For example, those who um, live on um, low-laying islands who are actually living the only place that they can live in the, in the world. Now, <clears throat> humanity's brought pretty um, incredible things into this world. And I don't know, the internet, right? And traveling to the moon and to Mars and artificial intelligence and um, um, so, so many uh, incredible uh, inventions we have. And we're able now to create information and to monitor things from space. And we're able to, to share that information and that knowledge between us. And yet we have created and locked ourselves into a self-destructing mechanism. We are traveling on a self-destructing planet right now. Um, you've all seen the horrific pictures from California where the skies are red. And uh, hold on, let me try to share my screen so I can scare you just a bit with some scary images. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, share screen. Here we go, share. Okay. Are we good? Is this working? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can okay. see that. Yeah. California. This was the woman. This is just so you have the image of what she had in the background, right? <laughs> um, we've all looked at the uh, horrific um, wildfires in California. May I remind you that only six or seven months ago, we had wildfires in Australia. And a little before that, we had wildfires in the Amazon. And if you recall those kind of media, spar media spurs, um, that went on for a few days about those. And, and a couple of months ago, we had 38 degrees in Siberia and we had uh, wildfires in Siberia, uh, which is, uh, I think it was about uh, 25 degrees higher than average temperatures in Siberia. Um, and we have floods. The top left picture is from Florida this morning um, where Hurricane Sally has hit. Uh, a third of Bangladesh is currently underwater after heavy floods. That's a top right picture. Um, and uh, Karachi on the bottom right, on the bottom left is also underwater. These are millions of people who are affected uh, by um, uh, devastating extreme weather events that climate change brings on. I haven't mentioned this because uh, I feel like I'm speaking to an intelligent crowd that knows that climate change is made out of kind of basically two basic um, um, elements. One of them is uh, global warming. So the ri a rise in uh, average temperatures, which in turn leads to uh, melting of glaciers, sea level rise, and a bunch of kind of slow uh, warming of the oceans um, and um, a variety of kind of very slow onset events. And then it has uh, also an element of extreme weather events, uh, floods, uh, heat waves, wildfires, um, uh, landslides, and uh, a variety of others um, that are not necessarily caused by climate change, but their intensity, their frequency, and their length are absolutely um, uh, contributed and attribute, uh, sorry, are attributed to climate change. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen for a second so I can go back to me. Great. Um, now, when we think about heat waves, because um, we've just seen a picture, you know, pictures of Bangladesh and Karachi, and I'm sure I'm speaking to people whose uh, levels of empathy are uh, very high if they're on this talk, but let's bring this closer to home. So I'm sure you care about people in Pakistan and people in Bangladesh. Um, some of you may have families there, some of you have visited, uh, and some of you are just decent human beings who who don't care who it is, and they know that people suffering uh, is people suffering. But let's talk about heat waves in the UK. The heat waves in the UK last summer, if you recall, there were three major heat waves, and they killed about 900 people in the UK alone. Excess deaths from that heat wave. We're talking about elderly people, 
um, who uh, don't know that they shouldn't wear a three-piece wool suit uh, and they should crack a window open in their uh, unventilated flats. We're talking about people with underlying health conditions, uh, with asthma and with um, pulmonary conditions um, that uh, died because of this heat, heat wave. And this is in a country that is um, the sixth largest, the sixth richest country in the world that has known and has communicated and has legislated on climate change. And we had 900 people die last year um, because of three heat waves in July and August 2019. That heat wave, by the way, killed 30,000 people across Europe, causing about 13 billion uh, uh, euros in financial damages. And some estimates um, think that um, uh, up to 70,000 people may have died um, um, in, 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 in future months. Now, a, a, a couple of, uh, of terms. So we know, we know what we need in order to um, solve uh, COVID. Um, and in order to solve COVID, we need a vaccination. So we need to stop the virus from spreading. Um, until we do that, we need to adapt our lives to this reality where this is happening and we need to sort of live with it uh, while trying not to get it worse. And then of course we have to uh, pay for the damages. I'm saying pay, but of course is live with the, live with the damages and pay for them in money or, in, or, in, or bear the cost um, of, uh, of what was lost. And of course we need to make sure that the conditions for the, the rise or, uh, of another virus in the future uh, are left uh, as low as possible. So in that sense, um, we will never be in a post-viral world. We will always be in a living with COVID or living with the viruses because we'll always attempt to keep a lid on them, make sure that everyone is vaccinated until the virus is eradicated, make sure that nothing happens, make sure that we're constantly have our policies up to date and know what to do when something happens. And climate change has a very similar structure for this crisis. Uh, and we call it mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. So with mitigation, we're looking to reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are causing uh, uh, climate change. In the meantime, we need to adapt to the changes that we're locked into. And by that, uh, we uh, are talking about, for example, increasing our uh, health capacity to deal, with, to deal with people who are, um, um, uh, for example, suffering from heat waves. Uh, or that uh, need to have their malaria vaccination because uh, when it's a bit hotter then the mosquitoes come a bit earlier. Uh, we need to make sure there are flood defenses up. We need to make sure there are early warning systems up for uh, hurricanes so we can uh, bring in the cows and protect, you know, and lock the doors before the hurricane hits or move away when the fires come. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, uh, pay those uh, whose livelihoods are lost and who are losing their homes uh, as a result of that. Now with mitigation, um, we're talking about, um, we've been talking about the Paris Agreement for, for the last five years and the Paris Agreement in 2015 was of course where the world uh, collectively committed to keeping global temperatures rise at no more than two degrees maximum um, over pre-industrial levels, right? This is, this is the language that we use since we started pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. However, uh, about two years ago, um, the IPCC, which is the scientific body which uh, advises uh, world governments on this, and there's hundreds, hundreds of scientists, thousands of scientists, I think, uh, contribute to IPCC reports. The IPCC um, released um, um, a special report on 1.5 degrees. The 1.5 degrees report said, actually, we really wanna stop uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees. And I wanna show you why and why we think that a half a degree is so much more um, uh, dramatic. So, uh, da, 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 da. you can see this, right? So what does a half degree mean? So with two degrees, 37% of the world is going to be, uh, of the population of the world is going to be exposed to heat waves. With one and a half degree, it's only 14%. Decline of annual catch of marine fisheries. So three million tons are gonna to be lost, uh, but only one and a half million tons are gonna be lost with this. Species lost, 16% species lost under a two degree scenario. Only 
right? In inverted commas, only 8% of the species on this planet will be lost to one and a half degrees. Now, imagine what it's like to say only 8% of the species will be lost, as, the, as if this is our grand prize, as if this is our grand trophy. And I want to point you out to one of my kind of saddest moments uh, looking at this report for the first time. In a two degrees world, there are no coral reefs in this world. Zero coral reefs, sorry, 1% coral reefs of what we have today. 1.5, which we are struggling to achieve now, means that only 70 to 90% of them are lost. We're gonna stay with maximum 30 and probably lower than, uh, than that of the coral reefs that we have with the massive implications uh, and the spillover effects that it has for, uh, for wildlife, um, for, uh, for marine life, for marine biodiversity, for oxygen uh, storage, and for multiple other things. And of course, uh, sea level rise um, means that 10 million fewer people are exposed in uh, uh, one and a half degrees rather than in two degrees. These are pretty horrible things. Now, in order to get to one and a half degrees, rather than to two degrees, um, sorry, we are at 1.2 degrees now, all right? We're climbing. We're now, the world is now 1.2 degrees hotter than it was um, uh, when the Industrial Revolution started. In order for us to get to 1.5, we need to do the very simple thing of not emitting any more greenhouse gases by 2050 or there's fine tuning of that, but I'll, I'll leave you to it. We need to not pump any CO2 into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases by 2070. But CO2 is the, is the major contributor and we need to stop it all together by 2050. If you remember that, um, we need to um, save, we have 12 years uh, to save the world in 2018. That was off the back of the 1.5 report because it, meant, it said that if we don't cut emissions by half by 2030, which was the 12 years from then, then we won't be on track to getting to zero by 2050. So net zero by 2050 and cutting emissions by 2030 is what we need to be doing. How are we doing on emissions? Really badly. We, are, we, have, a continuous, um, uh, we have a continuous rise in emissions rather than a drop. In the beginning of the COVID crisis, there was a, about eight weeks where emissions dropped. And emissions dropped because people stopped taking their cars, people stayed at home, people you know, turned off the lights in offices. Basically, economies were shut down. Um, so that there was an, I think, 18% decline um, for a couple of months. But we need to uh, have um, zero uh, emissions full stop uh, by 2050, which means that we need um, uh, much, much more than that. And in terms of planning, in order to do anything by 2030, we need to plan it yesterday and not today. Now, I hope I painted a grim enough picture for you to be both angry and sad. And I don't need to tell you that there's plenty of resources for you to get angrier and sadder. Um, feel free to roam them. As long as you listen to chapter three. And in chapter three, um, let me appeal to, um, to you as parents and carers or future parents, depending who's on, on here. I think, I think I saw a few young faces as well. Um, and you don't have to be biological parents. You can just be good friends and you can just be um, uh, fellow humans. But parenting is a good example because we com constantly ask yourself, you know, what do we need to do for our kids? And the main thing we need to do for our kids, obviously, and also for ourselves, is channel this fury and grief into action. What kind of action is needed? So the first thing is that we need to understand this, we need to communicate this, we need to make sure that as many people join forces together to knock down these kind of massive uh, walls. And I'm really trying hard not to um, um, uh, decorate this, uh, this conversation with uh, talking about capitalism and colonialism, but I just did it, so make of it what you will. Um, you know that these are two uh, forces that um, have been um, contributing to all of our problems and that we need to sort out um, in the wide sense of the world in order to sort this out.
But I'll leave those on the side for a second. In the beginning of lockdown, we all found uh, some refuge in our communities. All of a sudden, we started talking to our neighbors, we started WhatsApp groups in our streets, uh, we dropped groceries, we took care of each other, we knocked on our you know, elderly neighbors' doors and people knocked on ours. Uh, we, we made Zoom calls with distant relatives who we never planned to do that, but all of a sudden we, you know, we found ourselves doing that. Um, I expect the next Christmas will be a, a Zoom Christmas and a lot of people will be doing that. It's Jewish New Year on Friday. There's gonna be a lot of, um, a lot of uh, remote uh, community gatherings there. But we found a little bit refuge in our community and in our local, uh, in our local communities. And um, local solutions are critical to, uh, to this. And this is a state of mind that we can definitely adopt from COVID into the climate crisis. Because if you think about resilience um, uh, in, in, for, in face of adversity, then resilience is built locally. Um, in a heat wave, um, as, in a, as in a pandemic, you want to knock on your elderly neighbor's um, uh, door and make sure that they're fine. Um, and you don't want to find yourself in a situation where no one knows where you are uh, or haven't uh, uh, looked out for you. We want to make sure that our um, um, streets are um, safe for walking so we can socially distance ourselves uh, at the same time that we can play outside, breathe fresh air, um, and make sure that now working from home we are able to use our gardens and our streets uh, and our shared spaces for leisure, for health, and so on. It's exactly the same thing with climate. Um, growing food locally, uh, uh, supporting each other through uh, extreme weather events, uh, exchanging information, exchanging um, um, uh, good practices about how to uh, conduct ourselves. All of these are very much in our communities and are really critical. Of course, there's a series of personal changes um, that we all need to take. And we really all need to take them. When we think about um, the way we uh, consume, produce, uh, travel, um, and conduct ourselves uh, in, the, uh, in the consumer world, all of these are critical elements. Um, do we need two cars? Um, do we really need to take the car for this drive? Or can we walk? Or take, can we take the bus? Can we take the train up? Um, do we really need to eat meat and dairy? Um, do we really need to eat it that frequently? Do we really need um, uh, to buy this? Do we really need to order it on Amazon so it has additional delivery costs um, and transportation costs? Or can we go to the local shop and get some things? Can we make compromises on what we do, what we buy, how we can do, con conduct ourselves in the world? All of these are really important to consider with a massive, um, uh, with a massive but. And the massive but is that even if we did all of those things, that wouldn't be enough because so many of these things are interlinked into the systemic, um, into the way that the systems are built, that it's impossible to expect change without the policy change that is impacted, that, that, that leads to that. For example, if we could all afford um, um, electric cars, we wouldn't have anywhere to, to charge them, would we? There's maybe two plugging stations in my neighborhood um, and people are, are, are battling with uh, uh, planning permissions to put solar panels on some of the roofs or to put heat pumps on the roofs. I just tried to put a heat pump in my house and it was impossible and though I was very very motivated I had to give up uh, because it's super expensive, because there's bureaucratic challenges and because there's no support and there isn't sufficient knowledge even in the builders community on how to do that properly. So my willingness um, to, uh, to change and my even uh, potential financial ability to pay for change even then wouldn't be enough. So there's a lot of systemic changes that need to happen. If a train uh, ticket to Edinburgh would cost me 160 pounds, uh, but a flight up to Edinburgh will cost me 30 pounds, can you guess which one I'll take? Um, and um, if um, uh, gas continues costing three and a half uh, cents per kilowatt hour, why would I ever consider anything else? Um, those changes are um, uh, going to be massive changes 
and they will need support. And the people who will need the most support are the people um, who will struggle to pay for those themselves. So if we want to change gas boilers for everyone in the UK, for example, uh, if we need to, uh, to go into millions of homes and rip out gas boilers um, or exchange uh, the gas system with a hydrogen system or with heat pumps, we need um, a, a really complex layer of support. We need infrastructure building. Um, we need uh, early warning systems for, uh, for risks. We need better hospital capacity. We need all of those changes. And as with, as with COVID, staying at home and wearing a mask is nice, but if there aren't kind of vaccination programs, if there aren't systemic education programs, if there isn't, isn't health capacity, then all of the changes that we make are insufficient. So that's where our next role comes in, because all of those behavior changes are very much kind of consumer oriented. So I invite you to, into the next phase of agency, which is citizen agency. And this is where we decide how to strategically impact policy decisions by um, participation in our local communities, um, in our um, national communities, by um, sounding our voice, by making sure that um, our representatives are the right ones and that they are informed and that they know that we care and that they need to change their things. Without wishing to go into the details of the conflict, I'm sure you're aware that the low traffic neighborhoods that are being introduced in London today uh, are meeting a lot of resistance by, um, uh, by some people. Now, without making a comment on where these work and where these uh, don't work, we often hear only the resistance. And what we really need to hear is those who think differently and those who say, actually, this is great for us because. So we need to be both supportive of positive policy changes and resist negative or stagnation uh, in um, uh, negative changes or stagnation. And stagnation is our worst enemy here. Um, one of the uh, incredible things that um, is happening out of COVID, sorry, let me start this sentence again. By really making, uh, by really emphasizing that there is no single climate scientist that is happy about COVID or anyone operating in that space, not scientists, not policy people, not activists, nobody likes COVID. Um, but COVID offers a few opportunities for reflection and a few opportunities to step out of both crises at the same time. Um, the green recovery uh, notion is an opportunity to do all of those systemic changes whilst creating jobs um, and getting out of the um, financial crisis that of course follows looming behind uh, the COVID crisis, which we're all starting to experience right now. Um, when we talk about green recovery, we're talking about uh, putting in those infrastructure for charging electric vehicles. And we're talking about supporting a hydrogen economy. And we're talking about um, investing in, um, um, uh, uh, greening homes and insulating homes and, uh, and doing massive programs like that. And they're massive and they're going to be expensive. And this is why we need governments. I think in 1833, um, it was the Slavery Abolition Act in the UK. I did my homework. Um, and um, the government took, of course, the loan to pay, not the slaves. We don't have to push it, right? Uh, it wasn't a compensation. It was a compensation for the slave owners to pay them for depriving them of their valued resource. The UK government pay, uh, finished paying its loan that it took out to pay the slave owners in 2015, okay? We're talking about 180 something years. My, my math calculation is not really great right now. Um, um, uh, after taking that, the, world, uh, the UK finished paying its World War I debt in 2006. Governments have the capacity and the agency to take massive debts and to do really big things when they're needed. And the green recovery package, um, which is a, rec a recovery not only from COVID, but also a recovery from where we are on climate, uh, is one of those critical uh, junctures where action needs to be taken now. It's really easy to say climate change is later, let's solve COVID now. But we have a magical opportunity to solve both of those at the same time. On to hope, okay? for the next three minutes. Renewables are fast tracking in the world. Uh, in 2019, um, the most added resources um, uh, of energy in the world have been uh, renewable energy. Financial actors, those kind of um, 
uh, big symbols of capitalism like major investors are on board and uh, investor coalitions like Climate Action 100 Plus uh, are now, um, that, represent, uh, that have about of the half of the world's traded wealth, are now pushing the largest corporations and the, large, the highest emitting corporations to cut their emissions to net zero and are benchmarking them one, one against each other to push them into a race to the top, uh, a race to the bottom of the emissions, uh, I should say, uh, in order to do that. Um, companies are talking like we, haven't, we have never heard them before. Yes, 90% of that is greenwash. But 10% of that we would never hear before for the CEOs of Shell and BP and Rio Tinto uh, to talk about climate change, to acknowledge it in their annual reports is a progress. It's nowhere near enough, but it's there. Um, people are internalizing change. People are talking about climate. I had a, um, I'm doing building works in my house right now. And uh, one of the builders, 60 year old Irishman said to me, um, you should get double insulation because with, you know, climate change is coming, it's going to get hot in your loft. People are internalizing this discourse and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and we need to do more of that. And each one of you is an agent actually for that, for having those conversations with anyone who will listen. People are understanding complex risk. In that sense, COVID is a, a, a catalyst to understanding what happens when we don't take care, when we don't look at our environment when we don't internalize the risk from uh, uh, crazy crammed uh, animal farming, for example, which is uh, wh where the, the virus uh, uh, resulted from and so on. Our teens are in the streets when they can be in the streets. Um, agency by young people is on the rise. Uh, and the last two, three years have sh has shown incredible uh, determination by young people to, uh, to move on on climate change. And Beijing announced today that it's considering carbon neutrality by so net zero by 2050 and peaking its emissions um, uh, even sooner than uh, it had intended to. Previously announced that it would peak them in 2030 and it's um, uh, going to peak them earlier. All of these are excellent news. Uh, they're far from enough, but they show that we're in the right direction. Um, and that if we all uh, embrace our sense of agency, we'll be able to potentially to reach our destination, which is, you know, longevity and prosperity um, for us, for the next generations, for life on this earth, um, for justice to those um, who need it more than others. Well, we all need it, but some of us need it more than others. Um, and that's it. I think I'll, I'll pause here, hopefully on a happy note, um, and open the next 15 minutes or so to any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so as Michal said, um, and we're very happy, she's very happy to take questions. Um, I've got a couple that I received in the private chat. And I see Jim raising his hand. So if oh, people Jim, can raise yeah. their hands, that's also cool. If people wanna post questions in the chat. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, Jim, do you want to ask? Do you want to go with a question? Jim Smith, I'm calling on you as you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, oh, hang on. Am I muted? Can you? No, you're fine. We can okay. hear you. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Um, you spoke about COVID, of course, very important, very topical. I'm thinking about other effects of climate change on infectious disease and particularly on vector-borne diseases and climate change increasing the global spread of vector-borne diseases. I was wondering whether you thought about that at all. Um, absolutely. And um, when, I, when, I'm, when, I'm at the, when I'm at the LSE, then um, um, the person sitting right next to me uh, is uh, writing her PhD on exactly that. Um, so climate change contributes to a few things. Um, so climate change is, is definitely one of the, um, 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 I'm, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? One of the causes for increase in vector-borne diseases. Um, some of that is up to uh, is down to the um, uh, to the vectors themselves. So uh, it gets hotter, so the mosquitoes come earlier, for example. Um, uh, some of those is um, the change that, uh, for example, uh, deforestation causes, um, and the um, uh, and the clearing of uh, of areas and monocultures in agriculture. 
that lead to that, uh, crammed um, uh, uh, growing conditions, uh, uh, and so on, and the general decline in uh, in health that uh, uh, that comes with climate change, which makes um, the exposure to vector-borne diseases um, more risky. So. Um, the, the vectors are up, the population vulnerability is up, which means that the impact is higher. Um, and we see this with uh, a variety of diseases and we see this with, um, um, uh, we see this with malaria. Uh, of course, when we have water standing after a flood, that's a uh, infestation grounds for, um, um, for vector borne diseases and many other things. So absolutely yes, uh, climate change. Um, I mean, I didn't talk about everything, um, uh, everything there. Uh, ocean is, acidification is another one of those um, that is uh, that is critical, and the ocean absorbs about. Um, ooh, I can't remember my numbers now. Um, a significant number. <laughs> did I get away with that? A significant number of global warming uh, is absorbed by the ocean. I think it's like eighty percent. Uh, but um, um, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the the CO two which is melted there obviously causes the. Um, um, the decline in, uh, in, uh, in uh, marine biodiversity with knock-on effects to everything else. But yeah. Thanks, I've got loads of other questions, but I'll leave other people for a while. Thanks. Uh, you can use the raise hand uh, function, which is uh, next to participants, if you don't know where that is, if you want to do that. Um. Okay, so, um, oh, here's another question. Are there existing organizations that you recommend that already have a plan to support your ideas? Uh, thanks, Roger. Um, lots of organizations, um, um, and I'm not channeling anything um, new. I am uh, speaking on, um, I'm probably aggregating a bunch of things that a lot of people have said. Um, the, the, climate, uh, the climate community, if I can call it that, uh, is massive. There are uh, uh, tens of thousands of people who are working on this issue um, from a, a variety of angles, um, um, from, I don't know, from WWF to the World Bank, uh, to UNEP, to so the UN Environment Programme, to the UNF uh, um, uh, Climate Change uh, Organization. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, tons, uh, think tanks, uh, startups, uh, satellite monitoring uh, companies that look at deforestation from uh, from the top, uh, community support, climate justice organizations. Uh, it's unstoppable. If you want to uh, focus your question a little more on, uh, on that, then happy to, uh, happy to kind of point you in the right direction. But other than that, yeah, sort of everyone in different ways um, with different flavors, which is what we should be doing. It would be, it'd be really strange if we all spoke in the same voice. We all speak about in the same voice about the, um, um, the gravity and the need to solve this right now um yeah with with different flavors what is one thing i could do tomorrow that would make a difference to climate change katie p um i think that um we can so tomorrow um so there's no elections tomorrow um but i'd i'd, I'd go with two things i wish there were elections tomorrow so you could do that right um and for a number of other reasons um, but um, I would suggest looking at uh, two things. Probably um, looking at diets is one of the kind of easiest, closest to home uh, things that one can do tomorrow. Uh, and that has over a lifetime, the longest, like the, the, the most drastic impact on your carbon footprint. That's one thing. Um, even if there's no elections tomorrow, um, I'm going from consumer to citizen, um, you can uh, talk to your, or see what's going on in your uh, neighborhood uh, and see if you can contribute to any uh, local efforts that are going on. And the third thing that you can do probably is uh, talk to thy neighbor. Raise climate change in every conversation that you're having. Make it a part of your thinking process with your kids, with your neighbors, with your employers, with your employees, with how you think about every single thing. Uh, try to, um, um, to translate it into what it means and to what decisions need to be made by everyone, but mainly make it familiar. So it's not this thing that is, you know, every now and then you see a, a piece on the BBC 
uh, talking about the heat wave with a you know photo of people on the beach. Um, so yeah. Do I think that organizations such as Extinction Rebellion have a serious role to play in helping to address climate change? I do. Um, I think in every society, um, uh, there are multiple places for different kinds of actors. There will be those who tie themselves to the fence uh, or who climb a rig. Uh, and those will be the ones who will sit um, and uh, in the room with the policymakers and get them to write a new policy. And there will be the ones who invent a new technology that will help us materialize uh, potentially that policy. Uh, and Extinct Rebellion have um, played a major role in making this heard and making this understood. Now, Extinct Rebellion came with three demands. They came with um, uh, tell the truth, which led to the first uh, climate debate in the UK Parliament after two years, which never happened before. Um, um, so all of a sudden they forced them to, to show up. Um, they demanded uh, a redu uh, an increase uh, or a tightening of the UK's targets, um, which contributed to um, the atmosphere that led to the uh, tightening of the UK's legislated target in the UK, change in the UK Climate Change Act from an 80% reduction to a net zero. This happened a couple of years ago. And they demanded a citizen assembly and the citizens assembly, they said, let's get together as citizens. Let's not make this a government thing. Let's hear what the people have to say. And a citizens assembly was uh, indeed assembled and it uh, launched its report only last week, which I really recommend that you look for. It's really interesting. A hundred random people were selected, uh, a fishmonger from Leeds and a teacher from uh, Bristol and um, a variety of other people um, who never heard about climate change, who never thought about climate change, Got in, got in a room for six weekends and had crazy conversations and came up with, with fascinating and really consistent recommendations. So in that sense, Extinction Rebellion sort of got all of their demands, um, um, initial demands. And they've been pushing really hard and I have great appreciation for some of what they're doing. I disagree with some of their demands and I disagree with some of their tactics, but I think they're a really uh, critical actor here. To your point about Beijing's announcement, is there a new industrial revolution that embraces the forces of capitalism rather than opposes it? The UK also wants to be a leader in green innovation. Uh, thanks, Ashish, uh, and nice to see you also. Um, um, indeed, what's happening now, and, and I mentioned investors earlier, uh, really interesting to see how investors are playing this. And let's take uh, pension funds as, a, as an example. A little bit boring, but let's talk about pensions funds for a minute. Pension funds hold our money. Uh, and they're holding our money in trust and they have to give it to us in 30, 40, 50 years. In order for them to do that, as a collective, they need to ensure that we have a stable economy. They need to make sure that the world is more or less alive and that none of their assets collapse, that all governments are in place because this is, you know, this is their stability. Uh, in, in, in most countries, they also have like a legal obligation, a fiduciary duty to provide that. And what we're seeing now is institutional investors and mainly pension funds saying, we need to get a lid on this climate change story. And we need, as owners of assets, we need to make sure that the companies that we're uh, shareholders of are doing whatever it takes to bring down emissions. And this interplay where you harness capitalism, I, don't, I won't say against itself, but I'll say harness capitalism against its destructive nature and against its let's maximizing revenue for shareholders, but actually offer a new and fresh interpretation on what it is to maximize revenues for shareholders. It's not, you know, it's not a, um, it's not an isolated um, um, uh, phenomenon. It's something that we need to look at holistically. Then we're seeing really, really interesting movements here. And we're seeing trillions of dollars now behind initiatives uh, to, um, uh, to hold these corporates to account including reporting on their lobbying, including reporting um, on uh, whether they uh, have uh, governance measures in place and uh, measuring them on, uh, on their actual emissions um, uh, trajectory. So I think super interesting, um, super interesting developments there. Not to mention that renewables are becoming really cheap. And again, going back to Beijing, when you produce lots of something, it gets cheaper. So Beijing's, uh, so not just Beijing, of course, uh, China's uh, explosion of solar technology and increasingly of battery technology 
is something that uh, has led to a, a, a massive reduction in prices of renewables, which allows us today to be in a situation where I think it was last month that um, the UK had 60% of its uh, electricity grid fueled by uh, renewables and a lot of new um, uh, and, and, and almost all of the new um, newly introduced energy is um, uh, is renewable. And finally, on uh, UK innovation, and I realize that we're at the end of our hour, um, if we think about hydrogen, for example, the UK has an opportunity to innovate on uh, hydrogen, which uh, is a clean uh, replacement, uh, kind of a natural replacement to natural gas. Um, there are um, uh, efforts already uh, underway, but this needs an injection of incentives, of government incentives, um, with really like a really stable investment in order to make uh, the UK world leader here. The UK lost, I think, uh, its renewables leadership. I don't think it ever had a, a renewables leadership, uh, but in hydrogen, it still has a chance. In carbon capture and storage as well, which means sucking the carbon out of the air, basically stuffing it back into the ground, uh, which is something that we need to do regardless of, of everything else. Um, and we do have a few opportunities here. UK is about to host the next climate change summit in Glasgow next November. Uh, it needs to not only talk the talk, it really needs to walk the walk. So hopefully the next few months we will see um, policy actions from the UK government that are consistent with its talking the talk about being a leader on this and that also help us get over uh, or bring uh, the COVID and the financial crisis to a halt as much as we can, as soon as we can. I think I'll stop here and we're nine o'clock on the, on the clock. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much, Michal. Um, the last hour has been, as I'm sure you'll all agree, both in informative and inspiring. And I hope it's given us all food for thought and also hope for the future. So thank you. Yes, and what I found, one of the things I found really powerful was your thought that collective agency, with collective agency, there is hope. Anyway, if you're, if like me, you can't wait for more, please do follow the link to our forthcoming events page in the chat facility, which should be posted up now. Tomorrow lunchtime, Robert Orme, former history, history of art and cricket teacher at Latimer, will give the first of a five part lecture series on magical art, which it promises to be absolutely fascinating. We will also welcome former head Peter Winter, who will talk about his lifelong love of the country of France, its people, language and culture on the evening of the 23rd of September. And those are just a couple of the lectures that are coming up. I've also included a link to the donations page and a link to the video library, where you will find recordings from all the summer events to enjoy at your leisure. That brings us to the end of this evening's lecture. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Michal, for sharing your incredible knowledge and expertise. And I hope we see you all again very soon and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.